Hey everybody, Kamari Ellis here with another edition of Ask Kamari, but this edition is going to be a little bit different. Um, recently I've had a lot of conversations and a lot of questions about the black wealth gap. And actually I've seen a lot of a lot of articles written about it as well. Huffington Post released a bunch of articles basically based on a Pew Institute research report that came out basically saying that the black average median household wealth was about eleven thousand dollars compared to that to the national average which was about a hundred and forty one thousand dollars there's a stark difference so you know there's been a lot of uh, conversation and articles written about that but one of the things that really perplexes me is that these articles are written uh, they're talked about but there's really no solutions at hand so if you look back you know, last 50 years till the March on Washington, the unemployment rate for blacks in America have been double that of the national average. So right now, unemployment is about 5.5%. So it's safe to assume that black unemployment in America is about 11%. And there's some other issues with that because of the reporting. So it's probably a higher number than that. But let's just go with 11%. So that's still double that of the rest of the nation. And that's an issue. Um, and clearly that, that feeds right into wealth and wealth generation. And so if you have no wealth in this current generation, it's hard to really leave anything for the next generation or the generation after that. But I, re I really think that it's really a, a systemic problem, and you really can't expect a system to fix a problem that you have. You really have to be um, proactive to go about fixing the situation yourself. It's not, you know, pre-'64 before the Civil Rights Act, things are different now. So it's not like we're worried about um, being disenfranchised, not being able to live certain places. Black folks in America are very mobile. In the city where I'm from right now, Philadelphia, you have a black mayor, a black police commissioner, a black fire commissioner, a black uh, uh, president of city council, and a host of other folks who are on city council. So blacks in America have made great strides politically and educationally, but we haven't made those same strides economically and I think it's possible to do um, we just it just kind of really had to bear down and I want to just go over some points that I've been kind of thinking about and writing out for the last couple of weeks because um, I actually started to write a 500 word essay on this talking about the top 10 things that black America can do to close the wealth gap but that 500 words actually grew to about 3,000 words and now it's not 10 things, it's about 14 things. But today I just want to share 10 things with you, uh, 10 of the most important. And I'll share with you where you can find the other, the other four if you want to read the rest of the article. But to me, one of the most important things we can do right now as a people is develop an abundance mindset. Uh, many, many of our ancestors were enslaved, and that was a horrific time. But many of them escaped slavery or they brought themselves out of slavery. And they did that by being optimistic zealots. They were focused on what they wanted. They weren't necessarily focused on the current condition. They were focused on creating what they wanted going into the future. They were future oriented. So they said, what can I do now so I can change my future? And I feel we had to do the same thing. But in order to do that, we had to be able to see the good. We had to kind of look at life from a, a glass half full sort of perspective as opposed to a glass half empty sort of perspective. We always have to have hope. Um, if you don't have hope, then you're kind of, you know, super pessimistic and you don't really want to do anything else. So, you know, that's that's number one. Number two is we have to have a legacy mindset. And I'm just reading these off the top of uh, my list, but you have to have a legacy mindset. We really got to think about not just us, but what we can do for our children's children. Now that comes directly from Proverbs 13, 22, was really beaten to my head by my mother and all those church outings we've had when I was young. But when you think about it, you know, civil rights came along and they fulfilled their 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 obligation to the Proverbs 13.22. They're clearly leaving a legacy. Um, we have blacks on the Supreme Court. We have Latinos on the Supreme Court. And all of that was done by the work of many of the civil rights leaders in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now it's time for us to really pick up the mantle and say, all right, what can we do for us and our children? You know, Ben Franklin, when he died, he left $1,000 to two cities, one to Boston and one to Philadelphia. And he said that money was not to be touched for at least 200 years. And so at the time of that withdrawal, I believe it was in 1993, um, $2.5 million went to Philadelphia 
and about $5 million went to Boston. Now, I think Boston had been invested a little bit differently, and they actually pulled out past 1993. But from $1,000, from a mere $1,000, which actually was a whole hell of a lot of money in the 1700s, turned into millions. And so just think about what $1,000 set aside today could look like 100, 200 years from now and how that could really affect your family's life or your community's life. You know, we have to start really thinking long range like that. The other thing I think we need to do is we need to really be strong proponents of financial education. I went to Temple University. I could have went anywhere else, but I took the challenge, and that's where I went. I love Temple. But I was a finance major, and I was probably one of a handful of black finance majors at Temple University. I don't understand that. I don't understand how a community that's been so ravaged with financial issues doesn't want to be kind of on top of the game. And I understand finance is dog. It's boring to a lot of people. They're just not interested. But I think if there was a bigger push and a bigger concentration on it from the community overall, it can, it can make a big difference. If we had more accountants, more finance majors, more economics majors, how would that change the, the financial complexion of the community and say, 10, 15, or 20 years because now you have more people thinking about how to leverage, how to be creative with money, how to be um, good stewards of their money, how to be creators of money, creators of value. So I think that's something that would, that would be very, very, very helpful to the community if we started promoting financial finance education. The other thing um, I think we need to do is we need to talk about money. Now, this is just from my experience. From my experience with my friends and with my family, we really don't have deep conversations about money. Um, we, we'll talk kind of about money. We might talk about a new car. We got an interest rate we got or a mortgage we got and the interest rate we got on that. But it's usually from a debt perspective. Now, again, this is just from my perspective um, and my experience. It's not everybody's, and this is very broad. But I'm pretty sure I'm just kind of a, a small sampling of what's going on in other places. Now, when I talk with people from other cultures and other ethnic groups about money, it, used to be, it, it can be a bit more in-depth. They'll talk about some of the business deals they're doing. They'll talk about some of the stock they're on. They'll talk about how their 401k is performing. We should be doing the same thing, N not necessarily to make you know conversation boring and heavy, but to help raise our financial IQ. It's, it's nothing to you know go through the, the USA Today, look at the money section, and have a conversation about what's going on in the world of money around dinner. That's pretty easy. Um, you know, start doing that with your children. It'll help raise the financial IQ. It'll make things a lot better. It'll help to create more business-minded folks. Um, the next thing on the list is number five. We need to have not only adequate life insurance, but we need to start using life insurance as a wealth tool. Um, I, over the last couple of years, I've been to several funerals, several, and it seems like a lot of them, people had to pass the hat a lot of times to pay for the funeral, pay for the cost and things like that. And I don't begrudge any of them and I know everybody has different circumstances, but life insurance is so cheap and you really can buy it pennies on a dollar. You know, a guy 35 years old can get a million dollar policy sometimes for less than anywhere from 50 bucks to 30 bucks a month, depending on what kind of life insurance it is. And you know, as you're younger, you can get more of it at a cheaper rate. Now, the average American makes about $50,000 a year. Typically, life insurance, when they do the underwriting, they allow you to purchase anywhere from 10 to 30 times of what your annual salary is. So if you're just an average worker making $50,000 a year, 20 times that, that's a million bucks. So if you buy a million dollars of coverage, you can get that, again, somewhere between 30, 50, maybe a little bit more at all will depend on your health conditions and other factors as well, but it's very cheap. And let's say, you know, you live in a two-family, two-family, two-income household. If you live in a two-income household, and let's say y'all both make the average $50,000 a piece, that's $100,000. So you're a $100,000 income household. If one of you passes away, that means that two-income household has now been cut down to one. So that means only $50,000 is coming in to fund a household that usually runs on $100,000. That's a problem. And if you have children and a mortgage and, and car notes and credit card bills, which most average Americans have, it's a further, it's further a bigger issue. Now, if you would have just taken out a million dollars life insurance coverage, you would be able to 
cover your fifty thousand dollar income and replace that income not just for the rest of your life but you could do it indefinitely um in infinity if if managed properly it's not really hard for a million dollars to generate five percent um for the forever almost now things may change 50 years from now but that's still a pretty safe and sure bet that's something we could be using just imagine if um everybody in our community when someone passed and i hate i you know i'm not trying to make little of people passing but it's something that's going to happen but just imagine if everybody got something when everybody passed a million bucks and that was put into a fund to pay for college education to pay for business loans or business expansion for the family to pay for um, educational endeavors or other scientific and artistic endeavors it would change a lot of things in our community because now we're moving from a place of lack to a place of abundance so you know I think that's something we all have to think about next on the list is number six I think we need to dominate STEM now what does STEM stand for science technology engineering and math that's where the whole world is moving to the whole world is being moved around technology and science average jobs average job for STEM is about eighty thousand dollars a year as opposed to the average American is about fifty thousand dollars and I believe the average black person in America's annual income is about forty thousand dollars I have to double check the number but it's lower than the national average so just imagine if you're making eighty thousand dollars a year that's a significant change in lifestyle that's a significant change in what you can deliver as wealth to the next generations that's a significant change of the opportunities that you'll be afforded going forward in life to make money or experience different things so you know that's just a change of focus of of uh, college or, or educational background but we have to make some some severe steps or changes we have to force our children to be more inclined to focus on math and then focus on science and we'll see that bear out again 10 15 20 years um, I, I think that's really a no-brainer to me now one, one thing I find very interesting is uh, there's like this big push to support black owned businesses and I just for the record I do believe in supporting black owned businesses but not for not just because they're black that you know that that doesn't make any difference to me they should be supported because typically black owned businesses employ more blacks than any other group uh, or any other um, organization in the country with the exception of government so black owned businesses tend to hire more blacks and you can f you can find that across all ethnic groups usually but you can't just go to a, a bad company or a business just because of their color if they give you bad service I don't think you should go but if it's a good company and they do good business and they have good customer service good products and services you should use them all day long now Maggie Anderson wrote a book called our black year and it's where she basically spent with black owned um, companies for a whole year and black owned businesses for a whole year and it was a real struggle for her I actually interviewed her a couple of times but she said that right now two percent of one trillion dollars the african-american community in America generates is only spent with black owned businesses a mere two percent so she said if you just move that two percent number to ten percent it would make a world of difference it would actually create a million jobs so how does that look a million jobs created in the black community probably would eradicate a lot of crime probably would eradicate a lot of educational issues probably would eradicate um, a lot of a lot of uh, deprived neighborhoods so you know those are things we have to think about one of the best things you can do to support the black community is supporting a black owned business the other thing I would do is this is number eight all black youth organizations would have mandatory money classes now I know y'all think that's probably a little extreme yes little league baseball we will be talking about money we will be having classes on money it will be part of the curriculum base basketball football uh, cheerleading we all be talking about money now a buddy of mine Kevin Gee came up with a great idea he says why not talk to these kids that's playing football about football contracts pro football contracts how they make money how they make money with endorsements and talk about how they go broke it could really be helpful same thing for basketball same thing so forth and so on I, I don't see why we can't infuse money into the overall culture of black folks um, number nine I would say every black church and religious religious organization should also have money classes 
they should make their new members take money classes. Now, every church, a lot of them sometimes have problems collecting tithes. If they had a better understanding of money, I think they would understand that it takes money to run the buildings. It takes money to uh, operate some of the, the um, outreach programs that they have, some of the ministries that they have. And, you know, sometimes I think the black church gets, gets a bad rep uh, because historically the black church has been kind of a, a blanket, a covering for the community um, and, and doing a lot of things. But a lot of times, you know, you see preachers getting gold encrusted faucets or wanting to run uh, crowdfunding campaigns for jets. And it just kind of gives everything a, a kind of tainted view. But nonetheless, black churches have done a great amount of work. So you got to kind of look at it uh, in a fair and balanced way with real perspective. Every preacher doesn't have a caddy. And guess what? Most preachers actually work a different, a separate job in addition to um, preaching at their church. So you have to kind of put all that in the context. So just imagine if more of the congregants, more of the members understood how money comes into play. Uh, you know, it's it's a lot of things. Now you see a lot of black churches are still preaching the love of money or, or money is evil. But it's not actually money is evil. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. So I think a lot of those things can be changed around if we added more education into the church. Um, and number 10, last one, I think every black mega church or major church in metropolis areas should either get together and openly um, support black banks in their area. And if there aren't one or the one there isn't good enough, they should create new ones. And I think the world would be there. And I understand that there's some nonprofit nuances that the churches could get in trouble, but they could openly promote them. They could openly suggest uh, doing them. They could openly recommend that their parishioners um, make deposits into this bank. And that would make a big difference. Now, again, I talked about how how great the, the, the black church has been to the community. And, you know, soup kitchens, Christmas drives or gift drives for Christmas, uh, back to school drives. But can you imagine if a church was able to write a $10,000 check from the bank for a business loan? And then how many jobs that would then create? You know, we had to kind of think about it in a different paradigm. So, you know, I think that would have major, major implications. You see all these mega churches erected, erected new buildings over the last 10, 15 years. And a lot of times those loans were taken out with non-black banks. Can you imagine if the interest from those loans were going into black institutions that were then helping black businesses and black consumers do, do a lot of the things they need to do from a business standpoint and from a consumer standpoint? But again, that would help the economy. That would help the overall community. But those are just some things you have to think about. I mean, if, if you really think that unemployment rates are going to come down, which have been this high since the March on Washington, which was in 63, uh, without blacks in America doing something about it, I, I think I think you're uh, a bit misled on that one. If anything's to happen, it has to be it has to start with you, the individual, and then you have to see how you can work with other people in that same community to make things better. Same thing happens over and over again with other communities or other ethnic groups. We can do the same. We could close the wealth gap. I mean, we could actually destroy a wealth gap. So let me know. Tell me what you think about this list. Tell me if you think it's spot on. Did I miss out anything? Should I add some more things? Tell me what you think we can do to close uh, the black wealth gap. Until the next time, I'm Kamari Ellis. This is another segment of Ask Kamari. If you have any questions about investment, the economy, or just any money issues, feel free to ask Kamari. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.